Please welcome to the stage, Dina McLeod. Well, it is always a pleasure to be here around our family in Los Angeles at the Grammy Museum. And we do consider them family. Uh, they were with us from the beginning and they continue to be our valued advisors. But we've also got some family here from Tulsa as well, from the George Kaiser Family Foundation. We have some of our members who actually live in California and some of our performer friends who live in California and now our new adopted family, the Phil Oaks family, Megan and Michael Oaks, who are in the audience. So welcome to the family. Uh, we couldn't be prouder than to have you here today. The Woody Guthrie Center is dedicated to preserving Woody Guthrie's legacy. We house the Woody Guthrie archives, so we are honored to be the caretakers of that valuable piece of property. But more importantly, we share that with a new generation and share with them the power of one voice to change the world. You know, our, our goals are pretty, they're pretty modest. We want to change lives and we want to change the world. <laughs> <laughs> and we look forward to that. We use Woody's example, we use Phil Oak's example, Pete Seeger's example, and Mavis Staples' example of how one voice changes the world. One voice at a time, joining together with other voices, making a beautiful harmony, and showing people how the world can be a better place. Thank you, I love that yes. I feel like I'm in church. <laughs> so, uh, without going on further, without any, it, you know, pictures show so much more than I could tell you about the Woody Guthrie Center. So we're going to show you a little sizzle reel and what we do every single day. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Woody Guthrie Center. Many a month has come and gone since I wandered from my home. Those Oklahoma hills where I was born. In 2011, the George Kaiser Family Foundation purchased the archives from Nora Guthrie. The idea of the center itself came after that to engage the community and the region and as we promoted this educational message. The mission of the George Kaiser Family Foundation is for civic improvement, for educational opportunities for young people, and to reverse the cycle of poverty. We think we just embody that message here. We definitely see the civic improvement, this development and rejuvenation of the Brady Arts District and our part as a, a resource here. We've gone from this building being an abandoned warehouse to this beautiful facility and our neighbors in the arts next door and across the way. We have a gorgeous community park across the street that used to be a loading dock for semis. The transformation for the community has been amazing. We are just proud to be part of that. As far as reversing the cycle of poverty, our message is one of empowerment. Whatever you do, whatever your talents are, you do that and be proud of yourself. Quit believing all of the negative, that negative message that is coming, especially at young people, that they're not good enough. Woody didn't ever want to sing those songs that told people they weren't enough. Woody's message was to take pride in yourself and in your work. There is a beautiful irony in the location of this facility that promotes diversity and a message of unity and empowerment. It's, it's sitting in an area of Tulsa that was destroyed by race riots in, the, in 1921. Now we've got this beautiful park across the street where the community comes together. We've got this message of hope and unity and working together for a better tomorrow in this place. There's just something beautiful about that and the way we learn from our history. Our history is not necessarily pretty, but we shouldn't deny what happened in the past. We just need to do better and then 
find ways to empower people to help us with that vision of a more beautiful tomorrow for our own children. Because we're using Woody's example here as someone who understood his civic and social responsibilities, his patriotic duties, this is an important message for our young people to learn. You can't be apathetic. You can't accept just the way things are. If the way things are isn't the way you want it to be, if the way things are isn't uh, acknowledging the importance of every single person, then it's up to you to change it. There's power in one voice. There's power in one who's willing to stand up and make a difference. And we certainly want to encourage that in this new generation that is going to take over the, the running of our world. We hope that somewhere in this message, we engage at least one person to understand that, you know, if you want to make change, then you stand up, you speak up, and you do it in a positive way. You can make change in a society with violence as long as you have a gun pointed at someone. You can make a permanent change in society if you have a positive message and you show people how it's going to be better and engage them intellectually in that discussion. Okay, so that's what we do. And it's much the same as the Grammy Museum does, uh, showing how the arts can be an advocacy tool for social justice. Um, recently, in addition to Woody's archives, we were blessed to have Phil Oak's archives donated to us from his daughter, Megan. Um, Phil was a true child of Woody Guthrie. He continued Woody's work and promoted the idea of peace, justice, and equality, which follows so perfectly with Woody's message and what we try to do every single day. So to have Phil's collection joining Woody's and be housed in the same facility is, is simply an honor that we certainly can't put, we can't even put words into how we feel about that. But we feel it is a, a wonderful addition and a, a very suited place for him to be. And we thank Megan very much for her donation of those items. So, yes, definitely. Um, as, soon as, the, as soon as the donation was announced to the press, we started receiving uh, inquiries from academics who wanted to come and use those resources for their research for their projects. So in addition to having researchers using Woody's archives for academic works, now we have people who want to come and use Phil's, and we are anxious for that to, to see what's going to happen, what kind of uh, research is going to be conducted, and what kind of works are going to be uh, resulting from that. But uh, be before we get into that, we also want to make sure that we give a little more background information on Phil and what the award is that we're giving him tonight, as well as the Woody Guthrie Prize to, to Mavis Staples. Um, as we considered who to give the Woody Guthrie Prize to, we, we like to give that to someone who is still living, who is still working towards that social justice cause. But it seemed only appropriate that we should give a, an award to Phil Oakes as well for what he did while he was alive. So we created a Woody Guthrie Legacy Award for those people who are no longer with us physically, but are still with us in spirit, because we're still fighting the same battles that they were fighting and continuing their work as best we can. So we established a new award, the Woody Guthrie Legacy Award, that we're going to give to Phil Oakes. But before we do that, we want to show you a, 
a sizzle reel about Phil that his brother Michael so generously gave to us to use tonight. So ladies and gentlemen, Phil Oaks. Now in case there are any doubts about my position on the war, I've just been informed by a KPFK that the war is not over yet. So we'll sing it again. At the risk of being facetious, I'd say sing along, but you better not. This uh, might look like a party meeting. <clears throat> After the song, there'll be a recruiting sergeant out there. For those of you that are tired of anti-war songs, <laughs> Here we go again. Oh, I marched to the Battle of New at the end of the early British wars The young land started growing The young blood started flowing But I ain't marching anymore For I killed my share of engines In a thousand different fights I was there at the little big horn I heard many men lying I saw many more dying But I ain't marching anymore it's always the old to lead us to the wars, always the young to fall. Now look at all we've won with a saber and the gun. Tell me, is it worth it all? For I stole California from the Mexican land, fought in the bloody Civil War. Yes, I even killed my brothers and so many others But I ain't marching anymore For I marched to the battles of the German trench In a war that was bound to end all wars Oh, I must have killed a million men And now they want me back again But I ain't marching anymore It's always the old Lead us to the wars, always the young to fall. Now look at all we've won with a saber and a gun. Tell me, is it worth it all? For I flew the final mission in the Japanese sky, set off the mighty mushroom roar. When I saw the cities burning, I knew that I was learning that I ain't marching anymore. Now the labor leaders screaming when they close a missile plant. The United Fruit screams at the Cuban shore. Call it peace or call it treason, call it love or call it reason, but I ain't marching anymore. I ain't marching anymore Is there anybody here Who'd like to change his clothes into a uniform? Is there anybody here Who'd like to change his clothes into a uniform? Who thinks they're only serving on a raging storm? Is there anybody here Loyal to the end, whose duty is to die I want to see him, I want to wish him love I want to shake his hand, gonna call his name Put a medal on the man Is there anybody here who'd like to wrap the flag around an early grave? Is there anybody here who thinks they're standing taller on a battle way? Is there anybody here who'd like to do his part? A soldier to the world and a hero to his heart. I want to see him. 
I wanna wish him luck, I wanna shake his hand, gonna call his name, put a medal on the man. Show me prison, show me jail, show me a prison man whose face is growing pale, and I'll show you a young man with many reasons why, and there but for fortune may go you. Or I show me an alley, show me a train, show me a hobo who sleeps out in the rain, and I'll show you, young man, with many reasons why. And there but for fortune may go you or I Show me the whiskey stains on the floor Show me a drunken man as he stumbles out the door and I'll show you a young man with many reasons why there but for fortune may go you or I show me the country where the bombs had to fall Show me the ruins of the buildings once so tall And I'll show you young land with so many reasons why And there but for fortune may go you or I And so we're honored to be able to share with a new generation Woody Guthrie's message, but also Phil Oaks, because of course they ne need to hear these words. They need to know that their voice matters, just like Woody's voice mattered, just like Phil's voice mattered, and they have something important to say to the rest of the world. Um, if you noticed in your program in the, on the page that gives Phil's basic, really short biography that we have in there. There's a beautiful little picture of Phil and his daughter. That would be Megan. And Megan is here with us tonight to accept the Woody Guthrie Legacy Award on behalf of her father and her family. Megan, would you please come up? A true patriot, uh, like my father, understands that it's not only their right, but their responsibility to challenge their government when necessary. Growing up in an apolitical family with no real musical background, my father managed to become a passionate political musician. And uh, he attended Staunton Military Academy uh, with Barry Goldwater Jr.'s son, <laughs> and uh, he graduated a full-fledged lefty. <laughs> he found a way to interpret the uh, tumultuous political times that his generation was living through, uh, through his music. And he affected how his audiences were responding to the events that were unfolding around them. Music can be moving to people in a really visceral way and not only in the time that it's written, 
sometimes for generations and sometimes for centuries. Though I'm confident that my father would be pleased that um, his words and his music are moving to people, I think that he would be very sad that songs that were written about injustice more than 40 years ago are still so relevant. Um, the battles sadly never stay won. In my own small way, I carry on this work as a fundraiser for the ACLU of Southern California for the last 22 years. I am forever grateful to my father for his inspiration, and our family is grateful to the Woody Guthrie Center for honoring him here tonight. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> we have the This Machine's Kill Fascists on the guitar here. The Woody Guthrie Center presents the Woody Guthrie o Legacy Award to Phil Oakes in 2015, honoring those whose life work continues the legacy of Woody Guthrie through art and social activism. Applause for Megan Oaks, the Phil Oaks family, and the great and legendary Phil Oaks. I have to tell you this story. I'm from New Jersey. I'm growing up on the Jersey Shore. It's 1969, and um, I am a musician, or want to be a musician. I'm a senior in high school, and we have something called a Miss Point High contest, right? It's an annual variety show at Point Pleasant Beach High School, where I graduated from. And uh, because I was a folk singer, I got the opportunity to play behind a couple of the girls who were doing some skits. And then as a reward, we got a chance to play a song for the rest of the student body and all the parents who were there. And we had to have, we had to have our song um, approved by the, pr the principal. So I presented a song by Simon and Garfunkel. Uh, and I had my friend who was standing there with me saying, yes, we're going to do a song by Simon and Garfunkel, and it's called The Sounds of Silence. He said, oh, that's great. I know that song. I know that song. So we went through the, the Miss Point High contest, and we did this whole thing. And then it was my turn to, uh, to go up and do my song. And I promptly did Draft Dodger Rag <laughs> and was promptly suspended. All right? My father was a New Jersey state trooper. He didn't think the joke was uh, pleasant. And so backstage, he basically whacked me the side of the head and I got my first concussion. So it was, uh, Phil did that for me. But he was, for me and for so many people, my generation, your generation, such an important figure. A uh, man, when it came to really representing the legacy and spirit and soul of Woody Guthrie, I can't think of a, of a better person from that era who did it so well and was so inspirational to so many people. Um, it's such a great opportunity for us for, ha for having Phil have that first Legacy Award. This is going to go on and on, as will the Woody Guthrie Prize. And uh, it's always going to be Phil who was first in that. So I thank the Woody Guthrie Center for thinking of this. I especially thank the Phil Oaks family for seeing the way you did to bring the Phil Oaks archives to Tulsa and uh, have it sit side by side with Woody Guthrie. There couldn't be two better archives sitting side by side, so thank you very much. The, the Woody Guthrie Prize was actually a, uh, an idea that myself and Nora Guthrie, Woody's daughter, had for a while. Oh, about 2010 or so, we started to plan the Woody Guthrie Centennial. 
And again, if you recall, as I said earlier, uh, we made stops all over America. We began in Tulsa, rightfully so, since Woody was from Okima, Oklahoma, and the Woody Guthrie Center hadn't, hadn't opened yet. And we played at the historic Brady Theater, which is literally diagonal to the Woody Guthrie Center, for those of you who know Tulsa in that historic district. Um, and we started to think that there needed to be something that honored people today who have carried on and continue to carry on the work of Woody Guthrie. And we figured, you know, it's 2012 now, it's the centennial, how could you start any kind of Woody Guthrie Prize with any kind of, of um, mission that that award was supposed to carry without giving it to one man? I mean, it was a slam dunk. And that was Pete Seeger, right? Pete Seeger, as you probably know, was a lifelong friend of Woody Guthrie's. And when Woody took sick in the early 1950s, it was Pete Seeger who carried on Woody's legacy. Thanks to Pete Seeger, this land is your land is known not just by people all across America, but by people all across the world. That wasn't Woody's doing. He was sick. He couldn't do that. Pete Seeger did it for him. And then, of course, others, including his son Arlo. Uh, today, This Land is Your Land is maybe, as Bruce Springsteen said, the most perfect song ever written about America. So Pete Seeger did that, and we figured if we were going to do a Woody Guthrie Prize to a living legend, someone who living day-to-day a -day carries out this particular mission, Woody's mission, that it had to go to Pete Seeger. Well, we announced it, and um, soon after that, as you know, Pete took sick. And we were going to do this in May of last year. Realized he was getting sicker. We moved it up to uh, February, I believe, January or February of, of last year, with the hope that he would be alive to receive this award, which we knew based on his knowledge of hearing about that he was going to receive this. Uh, we felt very, very honored by this. So we hustled it through. We tried to get it and move it up as fast as we could. Unfortunately, we did not do it fast enough. In just a few days, week or whatever, I can't remember exactly what it was, but Pete Seeger had passed. So the very, very first Woody Guthrie prize that was meant to go to a living artist who carries out the tradition of Woody Guthrie had passed. It was a bittersweet for us because not only did we get to honor Pete in his passing, um, but we went along with it, and we went and, and carried it out, and we, this took place in New York City, and people like Steve Martin, Arlo Guthrie, and others came to the rescue very quickly, did the performances, and uh, allowed us to acknowledge Pete to his family, who, of course, uh, was grieving over his, over his passing. This time around, with the Woody Guthrie Prize, we knew that we wanted to honor someone who had been very high on the list the first time around. And it was someone that, when we thought about the work that had been done and thought about what's going on in the world today, the fight for civil rights and the fight for racial equality in this country, which when I was a kid and the civil rights movement occurred, we thought it was done. Okay, on to the next problem. But as we know, some problems take a long time to go away. Some problems go fallow for a while and then rear their ugly head in, in the worst ways possible. And today, of course, with what we have going on in this country, um, the racial stress, um, the killings, um, the bad vibes that just seem to envelop us, we thought back to the civil rights movement we needed to go and we needed to honor someone who specifically and fundamentally carried out some of the most courageous things musically and on those front lines. And who I was talking about uh, in particular were the Staple Singers, right? The Staple Singers were there in Mississippi. The Staple Singers were out there carrying on that good work because if you talk to anyone who knows anything about the civil rights movement, they will tell you that had music not been a part of that movement, that movement would not have succeeded. The reason, the music of the Staple Singers, the, the music of Bob Dylan, the music of uh, so many, so many artists, uh, they gave those young people in particular and those older folks in general 
the courage to carry on in the face of barking German shepherds and fire hoses with the power to knock you upside down and inside out uh, with p police billy clubs and brutality just gone crazy. It was the music that kept people together. You can imagine walking down a front line and seeing this and then he singing, singing songs that allowed people the opportunity to fortify their soul and their courage. And that's exactly what happened. Mavis Staples was certainly a vital part of the Staples Singers. She would give, and I'm sure she will tonight when we have a chance to talk to her, she will give, um, I'm sure, ample credence and, and respect to her father, Pop Staples, who was really the, 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 the creator of the group, and to her brothers and sisters, sisters and brother, who were very much a part of this as well. It was a powerful unit. When it was usually one singer here or there, when the Staples came on front, you knew you were in for not only great music, but for really heroic music, music that would let you conquer the world, and oftentimes they did in that particular moment in time. So when we thought about the Woody Guthrie Prize, we thought the person who needs to do this, who needs to accept this, not just for her, but on behalf of her family, was Mavis Staples. Mavis and I have known for a, quite a bit, actually, and, and last year, uh, she and I had this rare opportunity to go down to um, the LBJ Library, Lyndon Baines Johnson Library and Museum in Austin, Texas, and at, during that time, the LBJ Library was celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Voting Rights Act, which of course President Johnson got through Congress and was a landmark, landmark um, bill for civil rights in, in this country. And so the LBJ Library invited all living presidents to come to celebrate this momentous occasion, the 50th anniversary. President Carter came, President Clinton came, President George W. Bush, the elder Bush, couldn't because he was sick, and President Obama came. And it was a magical, magical three or four days worth of just about anybody who was still alive, who was connected to the civil rights movement, was there. And I got the opportunity to bring a couple of artists with me to talk about it, and I brought Mavis Staples. And she and I, which we will do tonight in just a little bit, we talked about the, the civil rights era and her role in it, and just the, the overall movement and, and the musical components of it. And it really brought the house down later, and she, she knows this to be true, but people had tears in their eyes. It was a powerful, powerful, for me, one of the most powerful things I had ever done. And, uh, and it really set the stage for what would happen later on, President Clinton's uh, address and others. Really, really an amazing thing. That, after that, I said, well, this is the woman. She needs to be number two when it comes to the Woody Guthrie Prize. So tonight, I am very, very honored to acknowledge this. But before we do, I wanted to show you something that I think you'll find interesting. Next year, there's a major documentary coming out on Mavis. And we got a little trailer that I would like to show for you just to whet your appetite uh, as to who this incredible soul is, but also to get you excited for this film because it's going to be a good one. Let's take a look. Now we've come this evening to bring you some joy, some happiness, inspiration, and some positive vibrations. I know a place I don't think anybody's ever heard a voice like Mavis If you're walking around thinking that Growing up in a black household in the 60s and the 70s The staple singers are part of my family soundtrack We were just family, you know, sounding like family With Mavis leading the way, the staple singers and pray on Oh my child the Staples were Chicago gospel pioneers. Very few gospel singers took an interest in civil rights. And I'm determined to go all the way until Dr. King's dream has been realized. She's not just about chasing hits and being famous and being popular. She, she's a messenger. Says you can watch the sun, see how steady she runs. Don't let it catch you with you. I know that we have been around the world and we're on stage, but I am 
Mavis, everyday people. I belong to the band. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've weathered the storms. I have fallen down and I've gotten back up. Please welcome to the stage the 2015 winner of the Woody Guthrie Prize, Mavis Staples. before we let Mavis take this award away from us, rightfully so, um, just, just a quick note. Uh, Woody Guthrie and his guitar, those, that was a machine that killed fascists. Pete Seeger and his banjo surrounded hate, forced it to surrender. Mavis Staples' voice, a force of nature against injustice, and inequality, and the Woody Guthrie Center couldn't be prouder than to be presenting her with this award, honoring her work and her continued work for equality and justice. Amen. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Oh my God. I know it's a It's beautiful. You want me to put it on my table? Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you so much. Well, I am, I am just overwhelmed and deeply honored to receive this award and uh, to be here with all of his friends, all of his loved ones, those of us who loved him. We didn't know him personally, but um, his music, that, that, uh, puts us closer to him. And I'm just, I'm just, uh, I, 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 you know, I've been crying already. <laughs> so you got me. Uh, <laughs> uh, I wish I could play the guitar for you. But Pops, he, uh, I asked him one day, I said, Daddy, after I had seen Sister Rosetta Tharp, you know, yeah, because that was the, yes, indeed. That was the first time uh, of my knowledge that ladies played guitar. I always thought it was just men because that was all I ever saw. And uh, when I saw her, I told Pops, I said, Daddy, I want to play that guitar. Would you teach me? He had me cut off my fingernails and, <laughs> and he drew me some little charts. And, and you know, I was pretty young. Pops was still a young man and, and he was frisky. So he gave me about three lessons, and then he threw his hands up. He said, Mavis, you go down there to Lion Healy. They'll teach you. And, and, and he took his guitar up. He said, I can't go through. It was too much for him. And I wasn't learning fast enough. And, uh, but I tell you, if I had been a little older, because um, I didn't know Lion Healy. I didn't know where he was talking about until later. And uh, I would have done that. I would have gone down and gotten the lesson and then let him teach me how to pick it. Because I told him, I said, I want to pick it like you and Sister were there to thought, you know. And, uh, but I would have loved to just have strum. I just strum. Uh, I love the uh, acoustic guitar. And uh, Pops had some of those around there, too. But uh, I'm just honored tonight. I'm grateful to be here. 
I intend to carry on, carry on the word and the, the love of, the, of um, Woody Guthrie. The songs that, you know, we were, I don't know, I was a teenager when I first heard Peter, Paul, and Mary singing, this land is your land, this land is my land, from California to the New York Island, from the Redwood Forest to the Rocky Waters. You know this land is made for you and me. Now what, bring, what could bring us together? A song like that. Oh. Yes, indeed. Yes, indeed. And uh, we loved it so much, the family, Staple Singers, we recorded this land. You know, so I just want to thank you all for helping me through this tonight. Because I tell you, I'm weak right now. I am weak in my knees. I'm just so grateful. I'm so grateful. Uh, and Bob, I tell you, yeah, Bob, he does this to me all the time. <laughs> he gets me all the time, but we, we did. We had a wonderful time in Austin, Texas. And uh, I'm just so glad to see my friend again tonight. Anytime he call on me, I'm available. You know? <laughs> so, thank you so much. <laughs> Yeah, okay. why don't you sit there? Got okay. a microphone for you. Okay. I, 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 I would have dressed up if I had, you know. I got dressed up. You they got never dressed up. Me like this. You represent. <laughs> you represent us. All right. <laughs> well, look, Mavis, again, congratulations, of course. But this is the time when we kind of talk about the work that you have done with, yes. the, with the group and, and Pops mm -hmm. and your sister's brother um, and, and what it all meant. So I want to take you back in time just a little bit. Okay. Go back to the evolution of the Staple Singers. How did the group get started and what was your role in it? Okay, you know, my father, Pop Staples, he, uh, he used to sing with an all-male group, the Trumpet Jubilees, six men. And Pops would go to rehearsal, he was in earnest, you know. He would go to rehearsal, come home, disgust it because there would be maybe three of them there. They would never come to rehearsal. He'd go again, come back, <clears throat> four there. Never the whole uh, amount of yeah. And uh, this last time, three times, and Pops came home, he went straight to the closet where he had a little guitar that he had bought at the pawn shop. And this guitar, it didn't even have all the strings on it. <laughs> but you know, Pops could make it sound good. And uh, it was the first time we had heard him play it. You know, so he, when he called us children, me, my siblings and I, he called us into the living room and he set us on the floor in a circle. And he told us, he said, we're going to sing. And boy, we, <laughs> he started giving us voices that he and his sisters and brothers would sing when they were in Mississippi. And there were 14 of them. I told him one time, I said, Daddy, y'all had a choir. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was seven boys and seven girls. Yeah, and Pops was the baby. Yes, he was. And uh, he was the last child. In fact, he and his brother, the last two, the, the, uh, the family had ran out of names. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they couldn't think of any name, but everybody in Mississippi had a Sears Roebuck catalog. You know. <laughs> so they named Uncle Sears Sears. <laughs> and when Pops came along, they named him Roebuck. <laughs> That's a true story. Yeah, yeah it's a true. Yeah, yeah. They, so yeah. they had him a Sears Roebuck in the family. <laughs> you know, I, I should tell them, some of you don't know this, and, this, and you don't either, I don't think, but yeah. in November, the Grammy Museum opens up its next museum 
called Grammy Museum Mississippi. We're actually opening up a brand new museum in the Mississippi Delta. The interesting thing about it is it's located, it will be located in Cleveland, Mississippi. Cleveland, Mississippi is just a few miles from the Dockery Plantation. Yes. This is where Pop Staples yes. actually grew up and worked and actually learned how to play That's blues and gospel for the very first time. Right. One of our initial exhibitions is called Mississippi Legends, and one of them, and there's a lot of people you could choose when it comes to Mississippi, Elvis Presley on down, great, great, a ton of bluesmen, and we selected Pop Staple to be one of the very first ones to be honored there. So Pop's uh, is gonna go home and be yes. right there where he grew up. It's gonna yes. be amazing. It's amazing, yeah. thank you so you much. Bet. You bet, yeah. Talk about Talk about then, how do you get start to sing? Do you, you, do you learn how to sing in the church? Well, no, I didn't learn how to sing in church. I sing, learned how to sing on the living room floor. floor? You know? <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, uh, Pops, you know, I was, I was a baby. I was about eight years old, you know, and my Aunt Katie lived with us. And, Kate, and Katie came through one night. She said, shucks, y'all sound pretty good. I believe I want y'all to sing at my church Sunday. And Lord, we were just so happy we were going to sing somewhere else other than the living room floor. <laughs> <laughs> we went to Aunt Katie's church that Sunday, and we sung. And you see, uh, uh, see Pops, uh, the very first song he taught us, he, we sang that, and we, we, the people liked us so much we had to sing it three times because it was the only song he had taught us all the way through. <laughs> And Pop says, shucks, these people like us. We're going home and learn some more songs. <laughs> but that was Will the Circle Be Unbroken. That's the very first song my father taught us. And, but now, the way I started to sing it, I was the baritone singer. Because my voice was heavy. I, you know, you, you, my acapella teacher would always tell me, Mavis, you're in the basement. <laughs> or maybe <laughs> either I'm in the basement or I'm singing with the boys. You know, I'm, I'm Mr. Finch. I'm not a soprano. I can't sing up there. You know, but when I finally started singing, Daddy, you know, Purvis was singing Lee. Purvis had a voice like Michael Jackson, real high. He was, you know, and he could sing everything. <laughs> and um, Purvis reached puberty. Overnight. <laughs> his voice, his voice was heavy overnight. You know? In the basement, in the basement with Mavis. Yeah, yeah. And 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 uh, Daddy says, Mavis, you're gonna have to sing lead because Purvis can't get up there no more. But, you know, for some reason, I could go high and low, you know. And uh, I said, No, Daddy, I don't want to sing that lead. You know, I thought baritone was the prettiest voice in the background. I said, I'm going to sing baritone. And I put my finger, I remember how I was telling, I want to sing baritone. Baritone. Mavis, you're going to have to sing lead. And I just kept denying it. And he, he had a little piece of belt that he cut off, you know, about this long. It was for me. And, <laughs> and he'd get my little legs, you know, when I was bad. And Pop started reaching over for that little bit. I said, okay, Daddy, I'll sing, I'll sing. <laughs> so <laughs> that started me. Uh, we sang a song called Uncloudy Day. And I was singing, well, what you call a ladies' bass. I was saying, well, 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 oh, Lord, they tell me now. And we'd sing it down in harmony. Whoa, they tell me. You know, and then when my part come, I would sing that. And do you know that this lady, Vivian Carter, from VJ Records, the day that we sang at my auntie's church, she was there. And she called Pop. She said, Staple, I want to record you and those children. And Pop told me, he said, well, no, Vivian, I don't know nothing about them records. So I don't want my children singing on no records. And he waited, you know, he sent my sister Yvonne. She went and got this big red book, this business of music. And she studied with him. <laughs> and Pops, he learned, you know. And because uh, Pops had gone back to school, you know. Pops, when he came out of Mississippi, he was like eighth grade. Yeah. And he went to Wendell Phillips High mm -hmm. School and got his diploma. Mm -hmm. 
So he was studying up on the music. Well, by the time I'm about 13 years old, Pops called Vivian, and he said, okay, Vivian, I'm going to let the children make the record. We're going to make a record. And um, that was when I was singing Uncloudy Day. She called the house one day. She said, Staples, this, this record is selling like a, an R&B. And uh, 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 just turned out, Uncloudy Day, Staples Singles, the very first yeah. gospel record to sell a million. Yeah, yeah. 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 it was. And that was, that was back in the 50s. Yeah. Yeah. I was a teenager, just made a teenager. Mm -hmm. And uh, we would go places. People started sending us letters from everywhere. We want to, we want to staple singers. Go. So we would drive, go to New Orleans, Memphis, Atlanta, and Pops would go up to school and tell the teachers, give Mavis some homework because she won't be here Monday. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a wonderful life. You, did, you, I got, did. I, <laughs> you know, but the, the interesting thing, you, you said before, you said people liked it because it sounded like R&B. You know, because in my thinking, this, the Staples crossed over so many. You kind of eliminated boundaries is what you did. Yes. There wasn't a whole lot of difference between gospel or soul and soul and R&B. Right. And you were able to kind of navigate all three of those equally, and people, I think, absolutely love that. That's right, that's right. You know, they never put us down. They never stopped loving us. You know, the, now the church people, when we made our take you there, they wanted to put us out of church. Yeah. <laughs> I was gonna ask you about that. Oh yeah. yeah, yeah, they wanted to put, they started saying the staple singers are singing the devil's music, you know. Because, because, you know, what they were hearing was that beat. And, and everybody would hit the floor and start dancing, you know? So, so uh, we had to do interviews. I would tell these people, listen, the devil ain't got no music. We ain't singing no devil's music, you know? Devil ain't got no music. All music is God's music. And they, I tell them, you know, you have to listen to our message, listen to what we're saying. We're telling you, I know a place. Ain't nobody crying. Ain't nobody worried. Ain't no smiling faces lying to the races. Now, where else could we be taking you but to heaven? <laughs> so, yeah, we can't. They backed off yeah, us. Yeah, they sure they did. They backed off. They sure we were invited back to church. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the very first request, I'll take you there. <laughs> right in the pulpit. We were jamming, but I'll take you there. You know, <laughs> but, but uh, you know, yes, I, I've, I've had a wonderful life. My father, my mother, my voice come from my mother's side of the family. Mm. Mama and her mother. They had very strong voices. And uh, my grandmother, we, Yvonne and I, would go to Mississippi. Pops would tell my grandmother, the children are wearing out too many pairs of shoes. I need help. So we would stay down there. And, and I got the worst. My grandmother, I'd rather for my father to get my legs than my grandma. Mm. Because she would tell me, you, now I'm singing. I, I was walking down this gravel road every morning. The jukebox is already playing. And what's on there was Ella and Buddy Johnson. Mm, yeah. You made me leave my happy home. And do you know, it, every morning, and I learned it. I learned it. So the kids at school, they knew I loved to sing. We were having a variety show. They pushed me on the stage. You know. <laughs> And when they pushed me on the stage, I'm standing up there, so I just started singing. You made me leave my happy home. <laughs> <laughs> my uncle, you know, school was from elementary to high school, junior high. My uncle was in junior high. He was about 16 or 17, tall, my mother's brother. And I saw him, his name was Ham. I saw him coming around the wall coming on up towards the stage. I said, oh, I'm thinking he's coming to pat me on my head, you know, and say, you're doing good. He got up there, he snatched me off that stage. <laughs> he snatched me 
that man, he walked me all the way out of the school, all the way to grandma's house. We get to grandma's house, he pushed me in the house and told my grandmother, this young and up at the schoolhouse singing the blues. <laughs> <laughs> and Lord have mercy, what did he do that? Oh, singing the blues, huh? You don't sing no blues in this family. You go out there and get me some switches. <laughs> Man, I go out there with my crazy stuff. I come back in, tell Grandma, Grandma, I can't find no switches. <laughs> <laughs> She said, youngin', you don't want me to have to go out there. You get me some switches. I came back in with a handful of switches, and she took the ones she wanted to do. I didn't realize them little bitty ones hurt worse than anything. She thought, get, you don't sing no blues in this family. You sing church songs. She him, nobody had ever told me what to sing. Yeah. You know, I was just a little girl. Yeah. And, and uh, I started printing letters home to mama, telling her I want to come home. Grandma won't let me sing. You know, she sent me back to school with my little dress, little pink whips on my leg. <laughs> <laughs> kids were laughing at me. You know, but uh, when I was 21, by this time my grandmother living with us, I had recorded Since I Fell For You. Mm -hmm. And I went in there, I said, Grandma, where? Yeah, baby. I said, come here, I want to let you hear something. <laughs> <laughs> she came on in the living room and I put it on. She said, you little booger, you ain't forget that, did you? <laughs> I said, no, ma'am. I didn't forget it, but you can't get me now. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, great story, great, great story. <laughs> but it wasn't just about church and blues and, and sacred music because the music takes on yet another dimension in the 1960s. And, you know, I talked yes. earlier, oh, yes. uh, the whole civil rights movement. Yes. There weren't a lot of blues men or even R&B people on the front lines like you guys. What prompted you? Where did you get the inspiration, you and your family, to be out there mm -hmm. endangering your lives, really, yeah. with what was going on? <clears throat> you know, Bob, Pops had had been hearing Dr. Martin Luther King on the radio. And uh, one one Sunday morning, we were in Montgomery. We didn't have to sing until that night, 8 o'clock. And Pops called my sisters and I to his room, and he told us, he said, listen, y'all, this man Martin is here, Martin Luther King. And I've been listening to him. He has a church here, and I would like to go to his 11 o'clock service. Do you all want to go? We said, yeah, Pops, we want to go. We all got in the car, went down to um, uh, Dr. King's church. Ebenezer Baptist? No, not Ebenezer. Ebenezer was in Atlanta. Um, um, and someone in, it issued us, you know, I'm, I'm, that's the first time that's happened the name of the church. I got brain fade up here. Yeah, um, uh, we were we were ushered in, seated. Dr. King acknowledged us, and um, he said, "We're glad to have Pop Staples and his daughters here this morning, and we hope you enjoy the service." Well, we enjoyed the service. After the service, Dr. King would go to the door, shake the worshippers' hands as they filed out, and. Uh, my sisters and I shook his hand. We went out. Pops, when he got up to him, he stood there and talked for a while. Well, he finally came on, and we get back to the hotel. And uh, Pops said, called us to his room again. He said, listen, you all, I like this man's message. I really like his message. And I think that if he can preach it, we can sing it. And we started singing, we started writing Freedom Song, March Up Freedom's Highway, uh, um, reach out, touch a hand, make a friend if you can. You know, we started, and we, we joined the movement. The movement was just getting started. And um, so uh, um, it just seemed that that was what we were supposed to do, where we were supposed to be, you know. Um, we would sing, Pops would, we would see, uh, different things happen, and perhaps write a song about it. Mm 
uh, uh, these Little Rock Nine, nine black children trying to integrate Central High School. And um, it went on for so long, these kids would walk proud, you know, with their heads up high and walk into a crowd. Every day the crowd got bigger. And they were sped up on, they would, rocks were thrown at them. And uh, it went on for so long, Bob, the, the, the mayor of uh, Little Rock, the governor of Arkansas, and the president of the United States said, let them children go to school. Lyndon B. Johnson, okay. let them go to school. And uh, so we were so excited. These kids were my age, you know, teenagers. And uh, we would all, Pops was in his recliner. We all gathered around on the floor. We wanted to see these children board that bus. And they were marching, they got on up to the bus. As Soon as they got to the door, a policeman put his billy club across the door. And Pop said, now why is he doing that? Why are they treating them so bad? And he wrote that song that night. Why am I treated so bad? Turned out to be Dr. King's favorite. You know, we would, you know, we, we would sing before Dr. King would speak at the, at the meetings. We'd be ready to, getting ready to go to a meeting. They'd be down in the parking lot. And you could hear Dr. King say, now stay up. You're going to sing my song tonight, right? <laughs> Pop said, oh, yeah, doctor. We're going to sing your song. And we would sing for him, Why Am I Treated So Bad? We would sing about three songs. If he wanted to hear another, we'd do another four. Mm -hmm. And then he would speak. Mm -hmm. And uh, we just, uh, we, we, we went through, you know, I didn't realize what trouble we was in. You know, my father knew because he come up in Mississippi. But he groomed us. He called himself grooming us mm -hmm. because our, our music was hotter in the South first yeah. and, and then it was in the state, in the, in the city. North, yeah. You know, and uh, so we were always going down South mm -hmm. to, to different programs. People, uh, um, they just wouldn't believe I was a girl singing with this heavy voice, you know. Mm -hmm. Oh no, that ain't no girl. <laughs> the disc jockey, the disc jockey would get on the radio and say, it's little Mavis Staple, little 13 year old girl singing uncut, and folk would be betting. We get down south, get to North Carolina, and the, the disc jockey said, well, you know, people are betting that this is, she's not a little girl, you know. She either got to be a man or a big fat lady. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no, that ain't that little kid singing. I was just a little knock kneed girl, skinny. All right, so we found out they're betting, betting. And, and, and what we did, you know, my brother, we would sing, Oh, they tell me of a home. Sing that all the way down in harmony. When my part was supposed to come, will, will, will. You know, they would just, purpose would ease up to the mic. And like he was going, and they would say, I told you that wasn't no little girl. That's him. It wasn't no little girl. And, and then purpose would ease over and I'd come in, will, will, will. <laughs> Boy, we had fun. <laughs> We had so much fun <laughs> fooling the people. And the people would, one man was just mad at me. Little old girl, I bet my whole paycheck. <laughs> Pop said, well, see, you shouldn't bet. That's right. Shouldn't bet. <laughs> you, the, the group, and you in particular, you were the inspiration for a lot of other artists to come into the movement to yes. sing and say, we have a talent, we're going to give that talent to the movement. And one of them was a young kid that you befriended and became real good friends with, Bob Dylan. Yeah. How did you meet Bob and what was that like? Oh, Bob, we, you know, we, we happened to be in New York and this was a g generally electric television show. And all of the folk singers were there. Er, er, Joan Baez, uh, uh, these brothers four, and uh, oh, just Richie, Richie Havens. Havens, yeah, oh shucks, everybody, <laughs> Joni Mitchell, you know, and so it was a lot of us there. Uh, Dylan's, we were outside when we met Dylan. His manager came and said, "I want you to meet the staple singers," and Bobby says, "I know the staple singers. I've been listening to the staple singers since I was 12 years old." <laughs> <laughs> 
And, and so Pop said, how do you know us? He said, I listened to Randy. And Randy was a, a station out in Nashville, 50,000 watt station. Everybody could hear Randy. And he went on to, to, to quote some words. He said, Pop's, yeah, Pop's voice is smooth and velvety, velvety voice. And Mavis, she gets rough sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> he, so, he said, uh, Mavis says, uh, yonder come little David with his rock and sling. I don't want to meet him. He's a dangerous man. <laughs> he, he knows the song. So we, 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 we just got to be friends. Bobby and my brother Purvis, they would talk all the time. They'd talk, and they'd be out on the stoop at night. Everybody, we'd be sleeping. They're out on the stoop with them a bottle of wine, just, just rattling off, you know. But uh, this was when he came through you know, we, we, we had to, it was so many of us, uh, they gave us meal tickets, and we were in line to have our lunch. Bob came through. Now, my family, we way up front. Bobby, he was way in the back. And all of a sudden, you hear, Pops, I want to marry Mavis. <laughs> <laughs> On the food line. <laughs> yeah, in the food line. And everybody looked around, ever. And uh, he, he was so little. Both of us were little. We were young, you know. Yeah. And uh, Pops yelled back, well, don't tell me, tell Mavis. <laughs> <laughs> and boy, it was a fun yeah. time. But then we would, we would be together a lot at different festivals because, you know, we sing in Strictly Gospel, and they were calling us to sing on folk festivals. Mm -hmm. And this was new to us, mm -hmm. you know. We, we would get there and we'd see all these flower children, all the pretty colors, you know. My sisters and I, we started making us dashikis and uh, uh, what do you call it, water? Tie-dye, tie-dye. Oh, you man. had a tie-dye? I got tie-dye, yeah. Oh, yeah, I love tie-dye. And we learned how to put them rubber bands around the T-shirts and dip them. And, oh, yeah, we was into it. And... Uh, <laughs> Odetta would be there, and uh, oh man, we just, it was just a beautiful, beautiful time. The flower, and do you know today, I still have some, some flower children come out. I can tell just as good, that, yeah, you were there back then. <laughs> yeah. But so, you guys, even as the civil rights movement is, is ending, or, or going toward its Apex, right at the uh, end of the 60s, and of course, Dr. King is assassinated. You guys are hitting the pop charts, too. You, you go from gospel, <laughs> R&B, soul, civil rights, social protest, and now you, you really become like rock stars. I mean, you were way up on the charts. You were really popular, black and white. How did, yeah. how did, how did pops feel about that? How did you feel about that? You know what? We, 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 uh, we felt really good. We felt really good, but we... we we stayed humble. We didn't go wild like uh, like they expect you to, you know. We we um, we were just grateful, yeah. and and like I say, we felt that we were doing what we were supposed to be doing. The kinds of songs because our songs uh, uh, after Dr. King was assassinated, our songs leaned more to message songs, yeah. you know, and um, um, positive messages and. Um, uh, you know, because we, 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 but we still, now I still sing freedom songs. I, yeah. Every one of our concerts, I got at least two freedom songs in, on the mm -hmm. list. Mm -hmm. But uh, we were just, you know, we were just blessed. We would, you, like you say, we would sing all types of songs. I recorded A House Is Not A Home. Yeah. And, and, I was so scared the church people were going to go against me. The gospel girl was playing House Not a Home on her show, yeah, you know. Yeah. So I said, well, something's going on. The Lord's taking good care of us. We can't, we can't miss. Mm -hmm. You know, everything we do is accepted. And like now, um, um, I'm getting ready to record again. Uh, I should be, thank you. 
I should be retiring. I should be talking about retiring. And, and, and why aren't you? And why, huh? are, and why aren't you? Why, where do you get the energy? Where do you get the, the drive to continue going? I mean, making you know, records. You're out on tour. You were just in, weren't you just in Australia or someplace? Yes, yeah. yes. Yes, we would, you know, I, 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 I think about retiring, and I think about, you know, how Pops told me one time, I used to didn't like to rehearse. You know, I, wouldn't, I didn't want to rehearse. And uh, Pops told me, he said, you know, I'm still a little girl. He said, Mavis, you have to use your voice. You know, your, your voice is God's gift. It's a gift. You don't know music. You don't even know what key you sing in. Yeah. <laughs> I still don't. <laughs> I don't. I still don't. When I get ready to make a record, I just have to ask the producers to stay with me now until I find out what's comfortable. You know. But um, he told me, he said, if you don't use it, he'll take it back. And that scared me. That scared me. I believed it. You know. And, and, uh, but now, I, 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 I know he won't take it back. I know, I know better, but, but <laughs> maybe. <laughs> but no, Lord, don't take my voice. <laughs> but that's what I've always said in these later years like this. As long as I have my voice, I'm going to sing. And not, there won't be no retiring. Won't be no retirement. <laughs> yeah. Well, before, before you do some singing for us, I know you, you want to do that. Let's open it up. Let's get a couple of questions from some mm -hmm. of your fans here. Why don't you just okay. lift the lights a little bit so we can see, and we'll give you the opportunity to ask a question or two if you have it. Would you put the house lights up just a little bit? Okay. We'd like to ask a question. Right over here. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. You know, <clears throat> and, uh, you listen out for, it is one kid that's coming along, that's singing the type of songs that we've been singing. And his name is Son Little. Son Little. Yeah, you know him. Yeah, he, he's great. And he's, he's uh, well, his record is not released yet. He's still in the studio. But you don't hear many. I wish there were more. You know, um, uh, because you want to someone to care. You you still got you know, I can look at television and I think I'm back in the sixties, you know, here recently. And and uh, so we need the, the the freedom songs are relevant. You need like but the, the main thing today is black matters, white matters. You know, those are the words that they're using today, but I, uh, I wish that, uh, I pray that someone will come along and pick up, you know, and, and continue singing songs, the, the, the message songs and freedom songs. Someone else? Yes. Yeah. Do you have a favorite song? So yes, sir. I have a favorite or? song. Will the circle be unbroken? <laughs> That's my favorite. Go ahead. Yeah. I know you like to sing because the sound system went out. You said it won't stop me from singing. You just sang acapella. And yeah. <laughs> but I wanted to ask you. I haven't heard much about your mom and what happened to your brother. How did your parents meet? And what happened to your brother? My brother is okay. My brother is at my mother and father's home in Dalton, Illinois. Purvis is doing well. He, he's still frisky. He's, he's, he, he's 80 years old, think he's a player, you know. <laughs> yeah, and he, uh, he helps me and my sister, Yvonne, he brings us fruit and, and different things when we come home. He, he'll get us certain dishes of uh, food over by where he lives. He thinks that's the best. And uh, 
But Purvis is doing well. And thanks for asking. And Mama, my mother, my mother and Pops uh, married. My mother was 16. Pops was 18. And they, Pops told, has taken us down to Mississippi, showed us where he proposed, has taken us all through, you know, like the cemetery with the, his grandfather, his great, they were slaves, and Pops' uh, grandparents, and, and he shows us Dockery's farm, you know, and uh, he, he's let us in on the, the whole life of him and my mother. But mama, my mother, I consider the world's best cook. My mother could burn, you know, and see Pops, my pops was so proud of her cooking. He would invite the entertainers to the house when they come to town, like Ray Charles, Nancy Wilson, everybody. He'd invite them over for dinner. And brother Ray Charles, he would just, he would just rock. He'd just be rocking. <laughs> He'd be rocking. He says, sister, you know, he says, sweet potato pie. This sweet potato pie, we could Franchise, we can start a franchise. <laughs> he said, we can make big ones, little ones, and then Pops was something else. Pops would take a sweet potato pie to the disc jockeys, you know, and, and uh, one disc jockey, E. Rodney Jones, he said, oh, mom, mom, staple sweet potato pie. He said, them staple singers, they don't need no payola, because they got paola. <laughs> <laughs> okay. One yeah. last question. One last question. What do we got here? Go ahead. Sorry. So one of my uh, favorite concert movies of all time is The Last Waltz. Yes. I'm curious how you got involved with that. Oh man. Well we were we were friends with the band. We were Levon yeah. and Robbie. We were all friends and we always felt like we were kind of sounding alike, you know. So when they recorded that, we liked it so much. But when they, they were doing the movie, they waited for us. They wanted us to sing The Wait because we were the first um, to do a remake. And Levon, Levon and Pops were best friends. Levon is the only person that I ever heard call my father Roba. Robot. <laughs> yeah, he would call him Robot, you know. And Levon, on, on one show we were doing, Levon, we took a break, and Levon was on his drums, so Pops walked back to his drums, and Levon had a cigarette in each hand. Pops said, Levon, man, you smoking two cigarettes at a time? Levon said, oh, Robot, you got to try this one. <laughs> <laughs> Pop said, "Man, I want out of that mess. I want." He, he was, and but but he, and you know, the two, yeah, the tour that we're doing right now, Levon's daughter, Amy Helm, she she's on the tour with us, and oh, she has a beautiful band, Amy Helm, and the handsome gentleman. That's the name of her. That's the name of her group. But yes, um, um, the last waltz, that was just an honor, you know, to see ourselves on the silver screen like that. And um, Martin Scorsese, you know, we met him. It was just beautiful. So uh, I still watch that. That's, 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 uh, it's one of the great that's ones. That's epic. Yeah. 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 It really is. Let's take one more question, if we have one. Right here. All right, go ahead. We got two. Go ahead. We'll end with a guy and a girl. You go first, and then you finish. Well, I just wanted to ask, of all the lessons you learned from your dad, what, what do you think the world needs to hear most now? What, what, what wisdom can you impart back then that we need to hear now? Um, um, Pops, the, the best thing that he, I learned from my father was to, he would tell me, you know, Mavis, one time we were in New York. I have to tell you this little short story. We were in New York, and there were some kids my age singing, 
sang before us, and they were all across the stage, and they were jumping around and singing loud, and you know. So when I started singing, I started doing that. And Pop snatched me, he said, Mavis, what are you doing? I said, Daddy, I'm singing. He said, Mavis, let me tell you something. You singing God's work. You're doing God's work. You're singing uh, sacred songs. You don't need gimmicks. You don't need to sing at the top of your voice. You don't need to be running back and forth across stage. You know, he said, you sing from your heart. Sing from your heart. Be sincere and sing from your heart. He said, what comes from the heart reaches the heart. And if you sing from your heart, you'll reach the people. You know, so I, I've never forgotten that. And I, 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 before I go on stage, I go to my heart. And I take it on stage with me. And that's, that's, a, that's, that's a lesson that my father taught me that I'll always Remember, to always be with me. Yeah. My pleasure. Yeah, I'd like to sing with Taylor Swift. <laughs> Let me sing to Taylor Smith's audience, you know? But, uh, but, but yeah, you are. Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, I had to do that. <laughs> I walked in here and all I could see was Taylor Swift. <laughs> <laughs> so let me get with Taylor Smith. <laughs> some more people, you know, I'd make some more friends, I think. <laughs> but uh, that's right. Bob, oh yeah, We're Bob. get the word. <laughs> why you think I'd keep tapping him? <laughs> I'm letting him know. <laughs> But now, what was the rest of your question? <laughs> <laughs> that was it? <laughs> oh, 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 yes, it was. Well, now, Curtis Mayfield. Yeah. 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 Prince. Yeah. yeah. Rakuda. Yeah. 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 And, and um, um, well, of course, Jeff Tweedy. That was our latest. But uh, uh, I have worked with, you know, and even the, the people... Uh, uh, Bruce Hornsby, I just recorded with him. Galactic, this group Galactic, and uh, yeah, you know them. Yeah. They are they're good, they're good guys. Um, um, I used to love uh, Etta James. You know that was my girl. And uh, now I'm listening to to uh, Jill Scott. Yeah. yeah, I love her. Mm -hmm. I love her. And uh, you know, it's not many that I don't like, um, but I, I I I lean towards certain ones. You know, um, I'm trying to think. I like, uh, yeah, I like Beyonce, mm -hmm. and to the left, to the left. <laughs> 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 yeah, like, and they're, they're, I like you know the youngsters. They're they're getting better. They're getting better. For a while, I just couldn't listen. I couldn't listen, you know. <laughs> but but you still got some to get and sneak through to my. I talk dirty to me. You talk dirty. Talk dirty to me. You know. <laughs> Why you want somebody to talk dirty to you? <laughs> but uh, I, I, it, it, it's going to be all right. I yeah. think it's going to be all right because they're getting better. You know Kanye is out there. <laughs> so it's getting better. Uh, we still have Bernice with the Sweet Honey and the Rock. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. we have some wonderful voices out. out and, and a lot of the babies, the children, uh, are come. well, you got people trying to keep the blues alive through the young people in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. uh, um, 
a friend of mine in Chicago, Billy Billy Bragg. Yeah, he's Billy uh, Bragg. helping young kids. He has a you know like a class for blues. You know the blues, blues and gospel. You know that's us. That's like cousins to me, first cousin. Mm -hmm. The blues and Howlin' Wolf. Yeah. I love Howlin' Wolf. Mm. And Howlin' Wolf scared me to death one time. <laughs> you know, he was a big man. And, and he lived right down the street from us in Chicago. I mean, he and Pops, Pops looked like a midget or now. <laughs> he, he, Pops, we sang on this blues show. And and Howlin' Wolf had that record, and that spoon, that spoon, that spoonful. Well, I'm standing there on the stage, and he had this great big spoon. <laughs> and he looked right at me, you know. He, he had a spoon. I like he was going to dip me up in that spoon. You know? <laughs> I screamed, I screamed, <laughs> and I ran off the stage. I ran, I ran right in Daddy's arms. I, Pop said, "But yes, we 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 have some uh, wonderful blues friends. Um, um, I don't know a whole lot of the youngsters today because we're traveling in different circuits. We don't run into them like um, you know. But I would like to to." Me, like I say, Miss Taylor. Yeah. We're going to work on that. Work on, work on it, Bob. Tell her, I bet, tell her, I'm all right. <laughs> that, that, that girl she probably made. already knows that. Yeah. Well, listen, on, on behalf of your fans um, in the Woody Guthrie Thank Center. Thank you. Grammy Museum, congratulations on the Woody Guthrie Prize. Oh, Thank you for sharing your stories. And how about we end it with some music? What do you say, okay, some okay. music? <laughs> Rick Holmstrom, y'all. Mm. I think I heard 
heard somebody calling my name Saying further up the road uh, Things are gonna change Still I'm treated so bad Well Well mm. Ooh so much. Why am I treated so bad? That was Dr. King's favorite. Yes. Uh. Isolated and afraid 
Open up, this is a raid. I wanna get it through to you. You're not alone. No, no. This is a raid. I wanna get it through to you. You're not alone. Oh no, I wanna get it through to you. You're not alone. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna get it through to you. That's the song that got me my very first Grammy. (laughs) All right. (laughs) Yeah, 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 wait a minute, wait a minute. (laughs) I had a feeling she wasn't quite ready yet. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Y'all don't forget now to see my documentary. Bob showed you some of it. Uh, when is it coming? Like January. January. Well, something like that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I know a place Y'all Ain't nobody crying No Ain't nobody worried No, no Ain't no smiling faces Uh Uh-uh No Lying to the races No Don't, but don't do Somebody help me here. Well, 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 help me all. Oh, yeah, oh, yes, help me now. Let me take you there. Let me take you there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Woo! Good God. 